poems I, I like to read have something to do with poetry, either uh, what it is or being in a poem. And uh, I'm going to start with one uh, by Pablo Neruda, which I think many of you have probably heard, but uh, I just came across it again, and uh, I found new things in it uh, at this time. I will say uh, I will read in English, but the edition of Neruda that I see over on the table is bilingual, and so I encourage you to pick it up and to read uh, uh, the Spanish uh, for yourself in this poem and, and uh, of, of his others. This poem is called La Poesia. And it was at that age poetry arrived in search of me. I don't know. I don't know where it came from, from winter or a river. I don't know how or when. No, they were not voices. They were not words nor silence. But from a street I was summoned from the branches of night, abruptly from the others among violent fires or returning alone. There I was without a face, and it touched me. I did not know what to say. My mouth had no way with names. My eyes were blind, and something ignited in my soul, fever or unremembered wings, and I went my own way, deciphering that burning fire, and I wrote the first bare line, bare, without substance, pure foolishness, pure wisdom of one who knows nothing. And suddenly, I saw the heavens unfastened and open. Planets, palpitating plantations, shadow, perforated, riddled with arrows, fire, and flowers, the winding night, the universe, and I, infinitesimal being, drunk with the great starry void, likeness, image of mystery, felt myself a pure part of the abyss. I wheeled with the stars. My heart broke loose on the wind. This summer, I, I heard a, a talk by actually a former poet who read at Lunch Poems, a uh, former poet here, Yusef Kumanyaka. He's visiting in the Bay Area, so many of you may have the opportunity to hear him this year, and I encourage you uh, to do so if you get the, the chance. His most recent book is, I think, Talking Dirty to the Gods. Uh, but he's very prolific, and he may have two or three out by, by the time you get to hear him. In any case, this summer he gave a talk about what poetry meant to him, and uh, for him, uh, poetry was not a language poetry. This kind of started out as a rant against deconstruction, but it very quickly turned into a passionate uh, talk about uh, poetry and jazz, and it was really a plea to expand our notions of what uh, is content, what is form, what is meaning. And it was really quite a beautiful and, and as I said, passionate talk. And so uh, afterwards, I, I was thinking about how challenging his vision was and how expansive. And I tried uh, to put down some notes about his talk and what it meant to me. And it, it uh, uh, forms a poem, the title of which is Blue Note. On the radio, music, rap, a thing I may not like, but this world beat rap, the first number of the Buena Vista Social Club CD, disassembled, a melodic disarray, the jazz sampled and riffed again, this time by another band, Cubans, two, three generations younger than the originals, living in Paris, who put words and sound back together. After A, after après un, après une mode, the sound, le son, sand on the playa, smell of Galois cigarettes dans la rue de Paris, the sheen old metal of 50s American cars running on and on the streets of Havana, bacalao, white sand, and sea of turquoise, the new tricolor, musicians in the tunnels of the metro on coral sands, conch shell and tropical night, Rambeau and Armstrong rehearsed together a humid release and lease of sound, words and light, avoiding erasure, 
thousands of renditions of a single piece, never the same, always bending, free form of warm nights, fishing boats, rows and rows of boats, seining notes, the way to impossibility, feet tapping beat sur le pont de Beaux-Arts, the revisions, a new experience of sound, lamentation in super slow-mo, need and abandonment, evoking and evanescing, black, opal blue, deep, graveyard of blue. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rumi has already been mentioned. Uh, I was uh, uh, already prepared to uh, uh, read another poem of Rumi's. I think I'd like to uh, close with a very uh, short one and with the uh, observation which uh, was uh, made uh, by Coleman Barks uh, right uh, about this time a year ago. And he, he said that all throughout the Islamic world, Rumi is a known and loved figure. And indeed, even the Taliban uh, allowed and encouraged Rumi's poetry to be played on the, on the radio. And in this country, as many of you know, Rumi is the uh, best-selling poet. So uh, with that uh, uh, observation and the hope for tolerance, uh, this is uh, a quatrain, I think. Night comes, then day. Night comes so people can sleep like fish in black water. Night comes, then day. Night comes, then day. Some pick up their tools. Others become the making itself. Thank you. The next reader is Orville Schell, who's the Dean of the School of Journalism. He also hosts that department's Feisty Speaker Series. And if you get a chance, go over to Northgate to hear some of the terrific um, speakers who Dean Schell has invited. Um, he has both an MA and a PhD in Chinese history from Berkeley. He's the author of 14 books, nine of them on China. He's also written widely for so many publications, I can't really name them all, New York Review of Books, New Yorker, Harper's Newsweek, and has been a commentator for three TV networks. Well, thank you. Um, in 1949, the German composer, uh, Richard Strauss, was given three verses uh, by Hermann Hesse on the sort of provisional nature of life. And this was at uh, Strauss's very last uh, year of life. And he set them to music. Uh, and I happened to hear the other night uh, the great uh, singer Rene Fleming <clears throat> speaking about how the events that had happened a year ago in New York had influenced her and what art meant to her. And it struck me that at this time, as we approach the anniversary of the World Trade Center, that we will hear many, many words. Uh, but really, nothing says it better than music. So I thought that I would read for you uh, this short verse by Hesse, and then just listen to her sing uh, one of Strauss's four last songs, which, alas, he uh, died before he um, was able to hear performed. Uh, this is the verse. Made tired by the day now, my passionate longing shall welcome the starry night like a tired child. Hands leave all your activity, brow forget all thought, for all my senses are about to go to sleep. And my soul, unguarded, will float freely in order to live in the magic circle of the night, deep in a thousandfold. Jill Stoner, an associate professor of architecture, has put together a very interesting anthology, which you'll see over there, called Poems for Architects. Her local architecture and planning projects include renovations to Lowell High School and the Fillmore Street revitalization. She's been honored by the local branch of the American Institute for Architects, and her current research activity includes architecture as fiction, the derivation of spatial words, and Jewish ghettos in Italy.
In his poem about poetry, Archibald MacLeish says, a poem should be palpable and mute as a globed fruit. For me, the poem is much more about the inside of the fruit. Um, it is a sensual and visceral experience. And I couldn't find a better poem to introduce this short reading than the one that I chose to introduce my own book um, for this lunch poem series. This is called Eating Poetry by Mark Strand. Ink runs from the corners of my mouth. There is no happiness like mine. I have been eating poetry. The librarian does not believe what she sees. Her eyes are sad and she walks with her hands in her dress. The poems are gone, the light is dim, the dogs are on the basement stairs and coming up. Their eyeballs roll, their blonde legs burn like brush. The poor librarian begins to stamp her feet and weep. She does not understand. When I get on my knees and lick her hand, she screams. I am a new man. I snarl at her and bark. I romp for joy in the bookish dark. As an architect, um, I am very interested in closed forms or strict forms of poetry. The one that I am most passionate about is the villanelle, a centuries-old form, um, presumably begun in the agrarian fields of Italy and sung in rounds. It's one of the forms that found uh, a very, very popular renaissance among 20th century poets, I think, because it is a form that in its circular motion and repetitive um, sequences, it allows us to both express um, a sense of loss and also the hope of redemption. I'm going to read two villanelles. The first is by Jacqueline Oshiro. She's a contemporary poet um, teaching in Utah. She writes really beautifully and poignantly about the Holocaust. But this poem um, is actually set in the American suburb. It's called Villanelle for the Middle of the Night. Call it the refrigerator's hum at night the even breathing of a sleeping house as a halo drifts in from a corner street light. Awake, you train an ear to single out a music jangling just beneath the noise. Call it the refrigerator's hum at night. Since you have no real hope of being accurate, but what you mean is usually as diffuse as a halo drifting in from a corner street light. Tonight, though, it is concentrated, intimate, luring you to store up what it says. Call it the refrigerator's hum at night. That, at least, accommodates the feel of it. To try to temper yearning into praise as a halo drifts from a corner street light, tempts an unsuspecting city street with its otherworldly armory of shadows. Call it, the refrigerator hums at night. Call it back. It's drifting, mourns the street light. The second is by Elizabeth Bishop. Um, it's a poem about letting go of things. It's called One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent, the art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Part of my, um, book assembles 
poems, um, I call them city poems, poems with images that I think are healthy ones for us um, trying to figure out how to work in our cities today. I want to read one by um, a Bay Area poet, Diana O'Hare, called The Retarded Children Find a World Built Just for Them. The doors of that city are 90 feet high. On their panels are frescoes of ships, of mountains. Inside is the children's kingdom, where the mad ones, the foot draggers, garglers, askew as a tower of beads, are sustained by the air. Buildings like great gold chains emboss themselves around the crazy children, their jewels. The children turn and turn like dancers. Their sweaters whirl out at their waists. Their long chopped hair scrapes the sides of the archways. They're happy. They're famous. They walk on the streets in crystal shoes. Lapis flows in the gutters. Around the edge of each building, there is a scarlet halo. And those children with eyes like scars, with tongues sewed to the roofs of their pallets, with hands that jerk like broken-backed squirrels, feed the writing of light from the buildings. They forgive us 90 times over. They sing and sing like all the birds of the desert. Last year, um, on September 11th, I was actually editing the galleys of this book, um, reading a long poem by James Merrill called An Urban Convalescence. And as I read the poem on that fateful day, I realized that one of the magical things about poems is that they reinvent themselves continually to speak to our time. I'm not going to read the whole poem. I'm only going to read the last four quatrains. Um, It takes place in New York. There are certain phrases which to use in a poem is like rubbing silver with quicksilver, bright but facile, the glamour deadens overnight. For instance, how the sickness of our time enhances then debases what I feel. At my desk I swallow in a glass of water no longer cordial, scarcely wet, a pill they had tried to make me take much later with the result that back into my imagination the city glides, like cities seen from the air. Mere smoke and sparkle to the passenger, having in mind another destination, which now is not that honey-slow descent of the Champs-Élysées, her hand in his, but the dull need to make some kind of house out of the life lived, out of the love spent. And the last, um, two short poems that I would like to read are also by Mark Strand. I think these are poems that help us figure out how to navigate uh, an increasingly complex geography. Black Maps. Not the attendance of stones nor the applauding wind shall let you know you have arrived, nor the sea that celebrates only departures, nor the mountains, nor the dying cities. Nothing will tell you where you are. Each moment is a place you've never been. You can walk believing you cast a light around you, but how will you know? The present is always dark. Its maps are black, rising from nothing, describing in their slow ascent into themselves their own voyage, its emptiness, the bleak, temperate necessity of its completion. As they rise into being, they are like breath. And if they are studied at all, it is only to find, too late, what you thought were concerns of yours do not exist. Your house is not marked on any of them, nor are your friends waiting for you to appear, nor are your enemies listing your faults. Only you are there saying hello to what you will be, and the black grass is holding up the black stars. Keeping things whole. In a field, I am the absence of field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air, and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. 
I move to keep things whole. Our last reader is Charles Towns, University Professor Emeritus of Physics in the Graduate School. In 1964, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work in inventing the maser and the laser. At UC Berkeley, where he's taught since 1967, he's also made major contributions in the field of astrophysics. I could list his many honors, but we'd be here another hour. Um, he's also a trustee of Berkeley's Pacific School of Religion and the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. Professor Towns. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and participate in this. I'm going to read today some selections from Alexander Pope's essay on man. Um, Pope, of course, lived almost three centuries ago, uh, and yet his ideas have a really remarkable permanent validity. I'm particularly impressed by the, his ideas on science, because we think of science as something of this generation. Uh, but you'll see his concepts were really uh, still very valid. Now, the essay on man is a very long poem. I'm going to read only a few selections. Uh, it's divided into four parts. The title of each part I'll read. This first part is the nature and state of man with respect to the universe. He who through vast immensity can pierce See worlds on worlds, compose one universe. Observe how system into system runs. What other planets circle other suns? What varied being peoples every star? May tell why heaven has made us as we are. Now, Pope recognizes the remarkable potential of humans. At the same time, you'll see he countermands that with pointing out our really sad weaknesses. Presumptuous man, the reason wouldst thou find why form so weak, so little, and so blind? First, if thou canst, the harder reason guess why form no weaker, blinder, and no less. Ask of thy mother earth why oaks are made, taller or stronger than the weeds they shade. Or ask of yonder argent fields above why Jove's satellites are less than Jove. The second section is a state of man with respect to himself as an individual. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. Placed on this isthmus of a middle state, a being darkly wise and rudely great, with too much knowledge for the skeptic side, with too much weakness for the stoic's pride, he hangs between, and doubts to act or rest, and doubts to deem himself a god or beast and doubt his mind or body to prefer, born but to die and reasoning but to err, alike in, in ignorance his reason such, whether he thinks too little or too much, chaos of thought and passion, all confused, still by himself abused or disabused, created half to rise and half to fall, great lord of all things, yet a prey to all, sole judge of truth in endless error hurled, the glory jest and riddle of the world, Go, wondrous creature, mount where science guides. Go measure earth, weigh air, and state the tides. Instruct the planets in what orbs to run. Correct old time and regulate the sun. Go soar with Plato to the ethereal sphere. Go, teach wisdom how to rule. Then drop into thyself and be a fool. Love, hope, joy, fair pleasure, smiling train, hate, fear, grief, the family of pain. These mixed with art and to do bounds confined make and maintain the balance of the mind. The third section is the nature and state of man with respect to society. Look around our world, behold the chain of love combining all below and all above. See plastic nature working to this end. The single atoms, each to other tend, attract, attracted to, the next in place, formed and impelled its neighbor to, neighbor to embrace. See matter next, with various 
life endued, pressed to one center still, the general good. See dying vegetables life sustain. See life dissolving vegetate again. All forms that perish, other forms supply. By turn, we catch the vital breath and die. Like bubbles on the sea of matter born, they rise, they break, and to the sea return. Nothing is foreign. Parts relate to whole. One all-extending, all-preserving soul connects each being, greatest with the least, made beast in aid of man and man of beast. All served, all serving. Nothing stands alone. The chain holds on, and where it ends, unknown. So drives self-love through just and through unjust to one man's power, ambition, lucre, lust. The same self-love in all becomes the cause of what restrains him, government and laws. For what one likes, if others like as well, what serves one will when many wills rebel? How shall he keep what, sleeping or awake, a weaker may surprise, a stronger take? His safety must his liberty restrain. All join to guard what each desires to gain. Forced into virtue thus by self-defense, even kings learn justice and benevolence. Self-love forsook the past path it first pursued and found the private in the public good. And now the fourth section, nature and the state of man with respect to happiness. Know all the good that individuals find are God and nature meant to mere mankind. Reasons hold pleasure. All the joys of sense lie in three words, health, peace, and competence. But health consists with temperance alone, and peace, O oh virtue, peace is all of thy own. The good or bad, the gifts of fortune gain, but these less taste them as they worse obtain. Say in pursuit of profit or delight, who risks the most? that take wrong means or right, of vice or virtue, whether blessed or cursed, which meets contempt or which compassion first. Count all the advantage prosperous vice attends, attains, tis but what virtue flies from and disdains. And grant the bad what happiness they would, one they must want, which is to pass for good. Thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Robert Hass, former U.S. Poet Laureate and professor in the English Department, who will begin today's program. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a wonderful set of readings this year, and we love this format. We're so grateful to all the readers that to begin the semester by celebrating poetry in the work that we all do on this campus. These Readings are so spectacular that we always get requests for tapes of them afterwards. I don't know if we'll be able to supply them this year or not, but they'll be on the web if you want to rehear this magical moment. Um, one of our colleagues, dearly beloved, a, a terrific force for poetry on this campus and in the world and for social justice, June Jordan died this past spring, and uh, we miss her. And we want to dedicate this first reading to her, and we've uh, invited her to be with us. And our next reader is Seda Chevdarian, who's been a lecturer in the French department since 1988. In 2001, she was one of four winners of the campus's Distinguished Teaching Award. She holds both a BA and a PhD from Berkeley, in addition to teaching undergraduate French courses and coordinating the introductory French classes for graduate students. She teaches the pilot class required of all novice instructors where they learn the best teaching practices. Please welcome her. Thank you. My secret wish is to stay and be left alone in Morrison Library after closing time. 
I'm delighted to be here. This is my oasis on campus. Um, for my reading today, I have chosen two po poems from two poets from opposite ends of the world, uh, both writing in very different style but conveying the same message. And the message is the reason that I chose these two poems, one in English by Ma Maya Angelou and the other one by a francophone poet from Cameroon, René Filon. I will read Maya Angelou's poem first and then a quick translation of the French poem and then with the reading of the French poem in the original language. Human Family by Maya Angelou. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious, some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity and others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse Bemuse, bemo delight, brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different although their features jibe, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China, we weep on England's moors, we laugh and moan in Guinea, we thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Now I will very quickly read my own translation of the French poem. It's called L'homme qui te ressemble, The Man Who Resembles You, by René Filon from Cameroon. I knocked on your door, I knocked on your heart, to have a place to sleep, to have some warmth. Why push me away? Open the door, my friend. Why do you ask me if I'm from Africa, if I'm from Asia, if I'm from America, if I am from Europe? Open the door, my friend. Why do you want to know the length of my nose, the thickness of my mouth, the color of my skin, and the name of my gods? Open the door, my friend. I am not black. I am not red. I am not yellow. I am not white. But I am simply a man. Open the door, my brother. Open your door. Open your heart. Because I am a man, the man of all times, the man of all heavens, a man just like you. And here's the French. L'homme qui te ressemble. J'ai frappé à ta porte, j'ai frappé à ton cœur, pour avoir bon lit, pour avoir bon feu. Pourquoi me repousser Ouvre-moi, mon frère. Pourquoi me demander si je suis d'Afrique, si je suis d'Amérique, si je suis d'Asie si je suis d'Europe, ouvre-moi, mon frère. Pourquoi me demander la longueur de mon nez, l'épaisseur de ma bouche, la couleur de ma peau et le nom de mes dieux Ouvre-moi, mon frère. Je ne suis pas un noir, je ne suis pas un rouge, je ne suis pas un jaune, je ne suis pas un blanc, mais je ne suis qu'un homme. Ouvre-moi, mon frère. Ouvre-moi ta porte, ouvre-moi ton cœur, car je suis un homme, l'homme de tous les temps, l'homme de tous les cieux, l'homme qui te ressemble. Merci. Thank you so much, Sada. Um, I uh, am teaching a class at 12.30, so I don't get to stay to hear this whole thing. 
unhappily. I'm going to get, however, to introduce one other reader, and that's Kathy Cockerell, who has worked as a reporter and an editor on the Berkeley and for the last six years, recently serving as acting editor. She's also the author of two books of short stories, The Simple Fact and Undershirts and Other Stories, both published by the lively and eminent Hanging Loose Press in New York City. Kathy. Um, I was just asked if I was Adrian Rich, so this is a special <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, each Thursday I leave work at the um, dot of 5 p.m. to meet up with the carpool that goes to Marin County. For the past year I've been a volunteer teaching assistant at San Quentin State Prison for an associate's degree um, college program run entirely by volunteers, many of them from UC Berkeley. As you might imagine, it's both challenging and very strange to be a teacher or a student inside a prison. The Department of Corrections book um, of rules and regulations is 203 pages long. It's got very tiny print. And on any given day, any one of its hundreds of rules um, could potentially keep the students from getting to the classroom or the teachers from getting, getting inside the gate. When all goes well and the students and volunteers tears all make it to the amazingly decrepit building called the uh, education building, my three years in the cl three hours in the classroom are always very moving and at least as educational to me as they are to the prisoners. The first, first poem I'd like to read is by Elmo Chapman Jr. It was written in a, a poetry workshop in San Quentin in the 1980s. Um, the leader of the workshop, um, Judith Tannenbaum, later borrowed the title of the poem, disguised as a poem, for a memoir of her years as a community artist at, at San Quentin. Um, Chapman is still uh, inside prison. He's in the uh, state prison in Vacaville, and his work is available on the web. Disguised as a poem. In Birkenstocks and handcrafted earrings, still living a life from the 60s, you enter this poem, you enter this place, this dungeon, this dust bowl on the edge of the bay where 3,000 men wait for the sweet rain called freedom. You walk a path from the front gate across the garden plaza, your pale feet step softly upon the spots where angry men have died. Don't let the pink and yellow roses fool you. This is not a pretty place. Two flights down, you wait for us to come bearing the fruits and scars of our embattled lives, disguised as poems, scrawled on bits of paper last week in a cell when sleep was hard to find. For three hours in that basement room, we are cut off, a million miles away from your daughter and your cat, a hundred yards from death row. For three hours, we joust. We orbit around each other, wrestling with words. We make love with words. We grow close. We meet in a place called poetry, one woman and a few captured men. We speak of poems and grasp at them like straws until it is time to go. Two flights up, the cool night air greets us. There are always those few tight minutes waiting for count to clear and the inevitable parting of the ways. We could go have coffee and speak of poems all night, but your daughter will miss you and I must be back in my cell before 10. It is always the same. For three hours, you or Favia or Sharon or Scoop manage to get close to me, only to be peeled away like the bark from a young tree, leaving behind a little spot bare and vulnerable that does not want to see you go, but will die of exposure long before you return. Um, the following piece is by the great 20th century Turkish poet Nazım Hikmet who spent 13 years as a political prisoner and whose work was banned for three decades. In 1949, he wrote this poem, translated here from the Turkish, some advice to those who serve time in prison. If instead of being hanged by the neck, you're thrown inside for not giving up hope in the world, your country, and people, if you do 10 or 15 years apart from the time you have left, you won't say, Better I had hung, swung from the end of a rope like a flag. You'll put your foot down and live. 
It may not be a pleasure exactly, but it's your solemn duty to live one more day despite the enemy. Part of you may live alone inside like a stone at the bottom of a well, but the other part of you must be so caught up in the flurry of the world that you shiver there inside when outside at 40 days distance a leaf moves. To wait for letters inside, to sing sad songs, or to lie awake all night staring at the ceiling is sweet but dangerous. Look at your face from shave to shave. Forget your age. Watch out, watch out for lice and for spring nights. And always remember to eat every last piece of bread. And don't forget to laugh heartily. And who knows? The woman you love may stop loving you. Don't say it's no big thing. It's like the snapping of a green branch to the man inside. To think of roses and gardens inside is bad. To think of seas and mountains is good. Read and write without rest. And I also advise weaving and making mirrors. I mean, it's not that you can't pass 10 or 15 years inside and more. You can, as long as the jewel on the left side of your chest doesn't lose its luster. By the way, the, the books that Kat, um, Kathy just read from are available um, fr at the table here, and so are many of the other poems that our readers are going to read today. Our next reader is Dave Dewar, who is the development director for Doe Library and frequently attends lunch poems. And I was thinking I've actually published something. It was in the summer of 1958 in the Aunt Elsie column of the Oakland Tribune, and it was called Sonny Blakewell's Grand Slam Home Run, and it was about the angst and existentialistic view of facing curveballs as a 12-year-old. It's also the same time that I read this poem for the last time in public at the uh, Victoria Street Variety Show in my parents' garage, where we used to charge three cents for people to come and hear us do things like that, and, and they came. <laughs> I'm going to read Robert's service, and he's not probably regarded as you know, a great poet, but I, I wanted to read just something briefly from his, uh, an obituary that appeared when he died, actually on my birthday, September 16, 1958. Uh, he was a poet's poet. To the people, he was great. They understood him and knew that any verse carrying the byline of Robert W. Service would be a lilting thing, clear, clean, and power-packed, beating out a story with a dramatic intensity that made the nerves tingle. And he was no poor Garrett-type poet either. His stuff made money hand over fist. One piece alone rolled up half a million dollars. He lived it up well and also gave a great deal to help others. And I thought, Boy, that's encouraging if you're a poet that you can actually make half a million bucks on a poem. <laughs> this isn't the poem I'm going to read, however. It is called The Cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Now, Sam McGee was from Tennessee where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. Though he'd often say in his homely way that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold, through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd closed, then the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we laid packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed and the stars overhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a sort of moan, it's the cursed cold, and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. It taint being dead. It's my awful dread of the icy grave that pains. 
So I want you to swear that foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. Well, a pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail. And we started on at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee, and before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, you may tax your brain and brawn, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies round in a ring howled out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh God, how I loathe the thing. And every day that quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, though the drogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, and it hearkened with a grin. Till I came to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chum. Then here, says I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. <laughs> Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, the furnace roared, such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike. For I didn't like to hear him sizzle so, and the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out, and they danced about, or again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked, and the door I opened wide, and there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile, you could see a mile, and he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee. It's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake Labarge that I cremated Sam McGee. Thank you. I always think that one of the marks of um, great imagery in a poem is that it, it sets a light in the mind, and uh, that poem certainly does. The next poet is, the next reader is Maxine Hung Kingston, who's a professor in the English department, and incidentally a UC Berkeley graduate, and her most recent book is entitled To Be the Poet from Harvard University Press. Welcome to, a, to the beginning of another uh, a school year. It's at a time like this when we plunge into the studying and the learning and the teaching and we forget about the poetry. And so today I would like to uh, give you or remind you of, um, of keeping the poet alive. Uh, and um, I have uh, two methods for doing that. Uh, the first method is to um, stop whatever you're doing and take a deep breath and write a forward poem. I have a collection of forward poems in To Be the Poet. So uh, I'm going to read, uh, oh, maybe about 30 of them. <laughs> Idea, forward poems, an old Chinese tradition. 
easier, faster than haiku. To carve on rocks, to write on door jams, to write on thresholds, to tattoo on arms. Anybody can write one. Form takes no time. Father Sky, Mother Earth. Um, Father Sky, Mother Earth is the way the Pueblo Indians address two of the, four, uh, two of the six directions. Father Sky, Mother Earth. Raid kills bugs dead. <laughs> that is a forward poem from one of my favorite poets, Lou Welch. And um, to support himself as a poet, he worked in an advertising agency. <laughs> and he wrote the poem that we all know and have memorized. Raid kills bugs dead. <laughs> Beyond mountains, more mountains. That was written by my father. And actually, he said that that was a metaphor for learning, that there are oh, beyond mountains, more mountains. And um, he, his name in poetry, or the name he wrote under as a poet, was Lazy Old Man. <laughs> Across rivers, more rivers. Old idle man, my father. Father gone, rabbit moon. Giant Antheria, Mother's Day. Sun beams me love. Red rootwood tree, one seed. Strawberry creek, be free. All rivers, be free. The oldest prayer is a four-word poem. May all beings be happy. Well, that's sayable in four words in Chinese. <laughs> all beings be happy. All beings be peaceful. All beings be kind. All beings be free. That line about being kind, I made up. A very American four-word poem. Kindness takes going into action. They sing, they're happy. We eat our fortune. Time can, idea can. Infinity ribbon circles all. And there is such a thing as a two-word poem, and five and seven-word poems, and the ultimate, the one-word poem, Fook, Shao. Oh, to say it all at once, one resounding word. My father named me Ting Ting after the four-word poem, Ting Ting Dok Lap standing alone as a mountain peak. Those sounds are pleasant to say in the Seyap Chinese ear. Lone travelers, monks, ghosts, lovers, free and independent spirits, poets, meet at the pavilion under the lone pine upon the hill. Stop, listen, burn offerings in the ting. I have another method for what to do when, um, uh, before you get inundated. And uh, this other method is to uh, make an ENSO. And uh, you, can, you can draw an ENSO when um, the words don't come. When you can't even think of four words to make a four-word poem, then just make an ENSO which is um, a Zen symbol of fullness and emptiness. Um, traditionally, you can only make these after you turn 60. And, uh, and, and by the time, but I, I'm going to give you permission. All you people who are younger than 60, you need it now, you know, at, at this time when you're getting through 
uh, the academic year, um, once in a while just stop and make an end so. You can always date it so that people will know that, you, that you, know, you made this imperfect one because you were so much younger than 60. And, uh, but when you get to be 60, um, then um, whatever you draw is perfect. It's uh, whatever comes out of you, whatever you're feeling at that moment, and you express it in this shape. And uh, even if it were crooked or incomplete, it's perfect. Um, but that's when you're 60. Um, just to uh, show you how easy it is to make a forward poem, I'm sure that while you were listening to me, that a whole lot of forward poems came to you right now. Um, is there anybody who has one? Could you raise your hand and, and, uh, and say it? How about some people up there? Okay, I'm going to give you an incentive. <laughs> Whoever comes up with a forward poem, I'm going to give you this as a prize. Good, so happy being here. <laughs> Thank you. Our next reader is Daniel Koshlin. <clears throat> He's a professor of, um, in the Graduate School of Molecular and Cell Biology. His research has produced significant discoveries about how enzymes function and control biological systems. I hope I'm getting this right. <laughs> the applications of his current work range from waste disposal to neurobiology and the design of therapies for Alzheimer's. A graduate of UC Berkeley, Professor Koshlin has served as chief editor of Science Magazine and the long list of organizations that have honored him includes the National Academy of Sciences. The campus has conferred on him its highest faculty award, the Berkeley Citation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm in a poetic mood because Mr. Rogo sent me a notice that I have to sign something swearing that I was over 18. And, uh, you know, at my age, it's really fun to have to swear you're over 18. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here, and I um, picked four, uh, three poems to express different aspects of what I consider poetry. One tells you about the insight into what makes a scientist exciting, why it's exciting to be a scientist. One is one of, I think, the great love poems of the English language, and the third is one that tells a little story. So the first one is the Maxwell Anderson's poem, which says, On this star, in this hard star adventure, knowing not what the fires mean to right and left, nor whether a meaning was intended or presumed, man can stand up and look out blind and say, In all these turning lights I find no clue. Only a masterless night, and in my blood no certain answer. Yet is my mind my own, yet is my heart a cry towards something dim in distance, which is higher than I am, and makes me mass and makes me emperor of the endless dark, even in seeking. The second is the love poem by Lord Byron, She Walks in Beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, of all that's best and dark and bright, what meets in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress and softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely, excuse me, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, 
how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, and tell of days of goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. And finally, the story by Elliot Thayer, Casey at the Bat. <laughs> it looked extremely rocky for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to six with one inning left to play. And so when Casey died at first and Burroughs did the same, a pallor wreathed, wreathed the features of the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go, leaving those, leaving there the rest with hope which springs eternal within the human breast. For they thought if only Casey would get a whack at that, they'd put up even money with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, and, so, and likewise so did Blake, and the former was a pudding and the latter was a fake. So the so then the stricken multitude, a death-like silence sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn hit, let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and the much despised Blakely tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had settled and they saw what had occurred, there was Blakey safe on second and Flynn a hugging third. Then from that gladdened multitude went up a joyous roar. It bounded from the mountain's tops and rattled in the dell. It struck upon the hillside and rebounded on the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped unto the place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile in Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in that crowd could doubt was Casey at the bat. 10,000 eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded as he, as he wiped them on his shirt. And while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed from Casey's eye a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leathered cover sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood watching in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the bleachers black with people, there rose a sullen roar from the beating of the storm waves like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone from the stand, and it's likely they would have done it had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising multitude and he bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher and again the spheroid threw, but Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, yelled the maddened multitude, and the echo answered fraud. But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold, they saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey would not let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched with hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher has, holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered with the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this lovely land, that sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, 
and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout, but there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Hey, is Norma Alarcon here yet? Oh, good. Okay, we're going to skip back through the alphabet because we missed Norma because um, she had a class that ended at 12.30. So um, Norma is a professor in three different departments, ethnic studies, women's studies, and Spanish and Portuguese. She's a leading authority on Chicana writers, has taught at Berkeley since 1987, and she's also the founder, editor, and publisher of a very extraordinary literary press, Third Woman Press, and she's authored books of literary criticism in both Spanish and English. Or Malaco. Uh, I came over here from from my class, and uh, let me see where. Oh, here they are. <laughs> my equipment here, my books for the poems that I selected for today. Um, uh, w the first poet um, that I decided to read something from is um, Miguel Piñero. Actually, he's not Chicano. He's Puerto Rican from New York City. And... Um, Currently, there is a film out there about him, and the film is called Piñero. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. Uh, it's one of those films that you know stays about three days at the local theater, maybe five, and then goes on. But I know that you can find it at Blackbuster <laughs> because I saw it there one night rentals because it's brand new. Now, Miguel Piñero was a playwright. Uh, and uh, he uh, was one of the first Latinos to have uh, a very successful play um, uh, and won an OB for his play called Short Highs, which is also a film um, that you might want to see. Uh, he, is, uh, was a, a, he was a poet. He died at the age of 42. I'm sorry, I should have said that first, I guess. Uh, he, was, he was a poet. So he was a poet, a playwright, an actor, and an actor. He was in films like, uh, in bit parts, he was in films like The Godfather, Fort Apache, The Bronx, and so on. And uh, he died in 1988 at the age of 42. The poem I selected is called A Lower East Side Poem. The Lower East Side um, for Puerto Rican artists and performers in New York is, it's like uh, the, the creates the artistic uh, synergy for, um, for everyone, not just Puerto Ricans, but all Latinos. And it is a very uh, loved ghetto. I, I once went there to the Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rican Poets Cafe, and the taxi driver was not sure he wanted to take me there uh, because he doesn't go in that neighborhood. A Lower East Side Poem. Just once before I die, I want to climb up on a tenement sky to dream my lungs out till I cry, then scatter my ashes through the Lower East Side. So let me sing my song tonight. Let me feel out of sight and let all eyes be dry when they scatter my ashes through the Lower East Side. From Houston to 14th Street, from 2nd Avenue to the mighty D, here the hustlers and suckers meet. The faggots and freaks will get all high on the ashes that have been scattered through the Lower East Side. There's no other place for me to be. There's no other place that I can see. There's no other town around that brings you up or keeps you down. No food, little heat sweeps by. Fancy cars and pimps, bars and juke saloons, and greasy spoons make my spirits fly. 
with my ashes scattered through the Lower East Side. A thief, a junkie, I have been, committed every known sin, Jews and Gentiles, bums and men of style, runaway child, police shooting wild, mother's futile, futile whales, pushers making sales, dope wheelers and cocaine dealers smoking pot, streets are hot, and feet of those who bleed to death. All that's true, all that's true, all that is true. But this ain't no lie when I ask that my ashes be scattered through the Lower East Side. So here I am, look at me. I stand proud as you can see, pleased to be from the Lower East, a street fighting man, a problem of this land. I am the philosopher of the criminal mind, a dweller of prison time, a cancer of Rockefeller's ghetto side. This concrete tomb is my home. To belong, to survive, you gotta be strong. You can't be shy, lest without request someone will scatter your ashes through the Lower East Side. I don't want to be buried in Puerto Rico. I don't want, to re I don't want rest in Long Island Cemetery. I want to be near the stabbing, shooting, gambling, fighting, and unnatural dying and new birth crying. So please, when I die, don't take me far away. Keep me nearby. Take my ashes and scatter them throughout the Lower East Side. That's Miguel Pinero. Um, uh, he was a drug addict uh, and uh, Part of that is reflected in that, in that poem. Uh, he was in prison for armed robbery. And it was in prison that he wrote his poem, uh, that he wrote his play, Short Eyes, which became a movie and a, and a, and a Broadway play. Um, And the movie Piñero, although, um, although it has, for example, some of the um, dis uh, distressful aspects of rec um, Requiem for a Dream, I don't know if you saw that, uh, has the spirit and the uplift that, that this poem has, despite its, its uh, tragic setting. Um, and the other poem I selected to finish up, to fin to, to finish up here, is uh, uh, "Quad Trains of Rumi." Uh, is from "Unseen Rain." Uh, I like uh, I like Rumi because, Frank, I don't have to be responsible to anyone for this for these poems. <laughs> In other words, Rumi's poems not only delight me and please me, but nobody will ever ask me anything uh, to be in any way responsible for it, their interpretation, their location, their, their emergence, their history, or anything of this kind, you know. So, um, and also they're only four lines long, uh, these square trains, and, um, and each one of them uh, you know, um, has some kind of, I don't, know, I don't know what you might call it, wisdom for the day or for the week. Uh, so here are at least a couple. I am filled with you, skin, blood, bone, brain, and soul. There's no room for lack of trust or trust. Nothing in this existence but that existence. And maybe I lost it. I think I lost it. I'll leave it there. Thank you.